My name is Lisa Ann Webb. I am here today to tell a story of hope and recovery for women who are still suffering with a substance use disorder. I was born the youngest of five kids, had a really, for the most part, a great childhood. There was some divorce and some alcohol use. I have lots of good memories, you know. Um, grew up on a farm in South Texas, ran around, you know, barefooted country girl, rode horses. You know, it was just a, it was a great childhood. I remember big parties at our house every now and then and some negative um, experiences happening uh, to me during those parties related to um, being touched inappropriately. You know, as you, you know, as I grew up and um, some of those um, drinking patterns were modeled for me through a parent, no fault of his own. He had an illness, just like I do. Um, my parents divorced and we moved from uh, Mission, Texas, is where I lived originally. Uh, my mom and I moved to Corpus Christi. We lived with my grandmother, so it was three generation family, um, which was such a wonderful thing because I got to really know my grandmother and, and uh, experience that whole thing. But, you know, I left everything I loved my siblings all my farm animals, my horse, all of that was gone. The life that I knew, you know, was gone. And my mom did the best she could do. Um, and, and I still saw my dad and I still traveled between, because he still lived in the valley and I still traveled between uh, Corpus and the valley. And I, I had a, you know, he was really, um, engaged in his uh, substance use disorder, alcohol use disorder. So I wish that relationship had been different, you know, earlier in my life, but I would have missed the beauty of the healing that happened later, you know, from when I got into recovery, you know, and long story short, about 15 was when I really started drinking and using on a regular basis and smoking a lot of weed as well. Um, and me and my friends were off to the races. I think at that point, my mother was exhausted from raising five kids, and <clears throat> she was just glad when I was home and alive at night, I think. There were many signs that there was something going on with me, <clears throat> but um, there wasn't any intervention from my parents. Questioned me more. They they just, it, it was amazing to me. Like, what... How did, how did that, how did nobody figure it out? There was one adult that knew what was going on with me, and that was my stepdad. And he was a um, lieutenant commander in the Navy. So there were little hints of things, red flags here and there in, a, in the fringes, right? <clears throat> so, um, and then it didn't help that I was dating um a boy that was, uh, got me into using other chemicals, cocaine and, and ec ecstasy and acid and those kinds of things. But my, my real love, my true love was alcohol. So that was a really super dysfunctional and sick, uh, abusive relationship that I was in. And finally I came to light. I don't know what happened. I kind of came to what that relationship taught me was not to take shit off of men and ever again, you know, um, that, that, that there's boundaries that have been crossed and they're not going to get crossed again. So, um, that was helpful, but also, you know, you fall back into the same behaviors. If there's no recovery, if there's no, uh, other option, failed out of college, and um, I just felt like Corpus wasn't really doing it for me. And my sisters both lived in Dallas. And I thought, well, let me, let me move to Dallas. All of the same behaviors. The, you know, the, the nightclubs are bigger and brighter and there's more cocaine. And, 
and more trouble to get in in Dallas than I got into it. Mornings that I would wake up and not know where I was or who I was sleeping next to and how I got there or what happened. So when you have enough of those mornings, um, and I think especially just as a woman and then the women that I talk to in recovery, there's a special kind of shame that comes with that. There's a special little bit, the knife goes a little bit deeper with that shame. Because what kind of woman does that? Over and over again. To herself. Because I had that moment of clarity, right, in high school that I wasn't gonna allow myself to be abused anymore. Yet I kept the abuse going through my addiction. And the shame would build and build and build and it just kept growing and it would multiply with every experience that I had like that. One night in Dallas, um, or morning, I don't know if it was morning or night, it was probably a night that turned to a morning, I was sure I was going to have a heart attack because I had I was at a party with my friends, right? And I, I'm pretty sure somebody put something in my drink because I hadn't taken, I don't remember taking anything that night in addition to all the alcohol I had had. But um, I felt like my heart, I, it was some kind of, like I felt like my heart was just going to explode. I have, and, and, I, and I had all these thoughts of like, oh my God, I'm going to die right here, right now in this party with these people. I don't know them. And my mom's going to have to find out that this is what happened to her to her daughter. And um, I somehow made it through that. I didn't go to the ER again. You know, God's knocking a little bit harder on my head, you know, my hard head. He's like, hello, you know, you need to pay attention to this. And um, I just got dressed for work and Went to work, buzzed out of my, I was like, eh. I mean, I'm sure my pupils were the size of a, you know, golf ball. Um, I just didn't think anything of it. Let's go to Jacksonville, Florida, right? So my, one of my best friends from high school had moved out there and I thought, well, hell that, that's as good a reason as any. And my brother actually lived there, so it wasn't like I didn't have anyone. But I packed my stuff up in my car. It looked like a shoebox. And I had my stuff packed like I had enough room for me to sit and drive. That was it. I called my dad and um, told him of my wonderful, super well thought out plan. I could tell that he had been drinking. I usually didn't like to talk to him after in the evenings. Um, because I knew I would not, I was not getting the, the, uh, alcohol free dad at that point. And, uh, he told me something to the effect of, if you move, don't call me if you ever need, don't, don't call me if you ever need anything pretty much because wherever you go, there you are, right? You've heard that saying before. And again, I was like, well, it'll be a fresh start and all, all there, all the, I had no idea that there was any, uh, that I should maybe stop drinking or maybe stop smoking weed or shouldn't do cocaine all night. Or I didn't know that. I just, you know, the denial again, piling on the shame. So, you know, got to Jacksonville, um, which I love that city, by the way. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a, I love it. It's a great city, but same stuff, different city. Different people, same Lisa, 
um, lots of uh, lots of driving under the influence th through my whole story. I mean, the whole like, you know, to, it, all that. Um, you know how I never got a DUI. I, I I really I really don't know. It was just certainly a matter of time. I you know I I don't have a legal history. I don't have a criminal history. It's not because I don't deserve one. It's just I just. I mean, I'm sure I was like one second from catching charges. I'm sure of it. My sister and I somehow got in a conversation about me coming over to France to be her nanny over there. Uh, here I am. I'm flying to Paris to be my sister's nanny. And, you know, she had no idea what was really going on with me, you know, because we don't tell. We don't say because we don't even know because we're in such denial that... You know, oh, things great. It's great. It's good. That was my mo the mask. Um, so I get to Europe. There was some of the same things, but you know, I had a child that I was responsible taking taking care of, and I believe she saved me. <laughs> she really gave me a purpose to be a different person. She was my, my light. I would wake up in the morning and I would go into her room to get her out of her crib and she would be standing there just with this joy, like just nobody was ever happy to, that happy to see me. I was enough removed from my normal influences there that I was able to have some clarity. And then things just started moving in a different direction. My other sister had started her journey of recovery. She was doing some group work and, you know, some therapeutic work. And, you know, she would call me and she'd say, hey, do you remember when this happened or that happened? And she was trying to figure out like, what the hell happened? Why, why am I the way I am today, right? Her behaviors manifested in a different way outwardly than mine did. Mine manifested through an alcohol use disorder. And she was my idol. And I thought, uh-oh. If she, if there's something wrong with her, then I'm definitely screwed in this situation. <laughs> like, it just was a moment of clarity. So she invited me to one of her therapy sessions. I had like a, I don't know, out of body experience. I don't know what happened, but it just all came out. You know, it was just a moment. So I credit my recovery today to my sister for that. Because she saved my life by inviting me to that session. So now you're raw. Now you're, now I'm like a throbbing nerve ending is pretty much how it feels to be stark raving sober. My denial was so deep that there was no way I was going to go right into a program of recovery for alcoholics. I'm not an alcoholic. I'm not like my dad. I remember going to a psychiatrist and I was really, I was in like, long-term withdrawal from alcohol is what the symptoms I was experiencing is that's what it was. Now that I know that today, but he said, that son of a bitch. He said, maybe you should go to a therapy group for people who are alcoholics. And I was like, what? How dare you? How dare you? Right. And you know, he, he knew he had my number. I'm pretty sure the first uh, support group meeting I went to, I was, I had, I had been drinking that day and I went and I had like beer on my breath. And so I did some work with the therapist immediately because I had to, it was either that I, and I, because I was having some suicidal thoughts. I was really more dangerously close to suicide in my addiction than I ever was when I got 
sober. <clears throat> but I was having a lot of um, remorse and guilt and shame. And, and those feelings are hard to deal with when you're stark raving sober and you don't really, when it's just early sobriety, you know, it's just raw. I used to tell people it felt like I drank battery acid. That's how I felt inside. Can you imagine? Can you imagine how that feels? Like the worst indigestion you've ever felt, but all the time. Questioning everything I ever thought I knew about anything, questioning any truth I ever thought I knew. The saving grace, I believe, is I have a praying mother. <sighs> and I know that her prayers kept me safe, for sure. I was raised with a God. I was raised in, in a Catholic religion. I'm not Catholic anymore, but I practice um, Christianity. And the veil of that darkness that I shared in that therapy session, had it lifted, right? And the joy started to show. Um, I was working at, I was a receptionist, and, and he came in, and it was over. He was so cute and just... Um, so cute <laughs> and so sweet. And I, he's seen me at my, my most vulnerable. We got married in 94. Alcohol has not served me well. Chemicals, they just don't work with me. My body, my genetics, my life experience, my family history that goes back hundreds of years people having alcohol use disorder from what little tidbits I can get from, right, from my mom and that from who, what I got from my grandmother, tell me the story about how the, uh, when my grandmother, my great grandmother would borrow the mule for the day, you know, the wagon and the mule, that the mule would stop at the liquor store. I'm not making this up. He would stop at the liquor store and she's like, I'm not going to the liquor store. The mule's like, well, I am. <laughs> anyway, I don't know if that's, I mean, that's the story I was told, right? And it was like, hee, 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 that's funny. And today it's not really that funny because <laughs> there's a reason why the mule was stopping at the liquor store, right? Creature. I don't think he was thirsty. <laughs> anyway, um, so I succumbed, right, to... I accepted um, that uh, I'm an alcoholic. I have an alcohol use disorder. Started working a really solid recovery program with sponsors and friends. And, you know, just before this meeting today, I texted my girls. I texted those women that carried me through my early recovery, uh, my early years of recovery that still carry me today. These relationships that we built in the train wreck of our lives, right? During the bloody years, because early recovery is, is bloody. It, it's ugly, it's bloody, it's painful, it's beautiful, it's joyful, <laughs> it's miraculous. And the main point that I want to get across today, if you don't hear anything else, is that you, you, I'm talking to you, you are worth it. What you did in your addiction is what you did in your addiction. That's not who you are. That's not who God made you to be. It's an illness. Today, these are not tears of pain or shame. These are tears of gratitude and joy for the life that I've been able to lead after I got sober. Went back to school. I settled for psychology because one of the things I've always tried to do is figure people out. That's just my nature, right? It's one of my gifts. The other thing is, Recovery is fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. I am a, a board member now. 
Imagine that. Barefooted in the chicken coop to board member on uh, the Texas Association of Addiction Professionals. How do you, how does that happen, right? It happens through the vortex we call recovery. So I just felt like maybe we should adopt a child, right? We haven't gotten pregnant this whole time. Not that we didn't practice, but anyway, I digress. We um, talked about it, and he was like, yeah, maybe we should. And I was like, okay, yeah, let's do that. And so we adopted a child. We adopted a baby girl from China. The process of that is like almost like it's, I call it a birth on paper because it's grueling. FBI background, state background check, fingerprints, blood work. I mean, the whole nine. And it happened to be that their requirement, whatever that means, <laughs> is that you be sober 10 years and I had just passed my 10-year birthday. I met, I met the requirement. So we went to China in 2005, August of 2005, to get our baby. We went to China. I got to walk on the Great Wall. But I got to do that because I'm a sober woman. My dad had been doing some recovery of his own, in his own way. And he saw my grades, and he paid for the rest of my school. <laughs> and he said, I'm so proud of you. He was in his own, own recovery in, in some ways. Our relationship started to change, and when it came time, I made amends to him for blaming him for everything that bad that had happened in my life, for accusing him of making me an alcoholic. Any relationship can heal. In this particular instance with my dad, we were, we had 100% healing happen because of the work I did, but also because of the work he did. Today, our daughter is 18 years old. She's publishing a research paper on biomechanical engineering. She's my heart. To the women in recovery, to the women who are suffering, Allow yourself to be vulnerable enough to ask for help. It's my experience through being a treatment professional for 14 years that our loved ones have a very significant part to play in helping us in the path to recovery. Allow your loved ones to love you and know that they see things you don't. Even today, I still have shame coming up right now, right? But my warrior inside of me says not today because I'm a, a warrior for this disease. And, and so are you. You just haven't found your armor yet. So find your armor. <laughs>